back to Staking Mondays. Staking Mondays is a weekly show to share knowledge from key staking industry leaders with our community. Of course, this is all powered by stakingrewards.com. As Staking Rewards, we are helping investors navigate the landscape of yield generating digital assets, helping them find the best opportunities to earn interest on crypto. I'd like to remind everyone watching here to register for the 2021 Staking Summit hosted by Staking Rewards. This will take place on Wednesday, October 20th, and you can find the registration link in the Staking Rewards Twitter timeline. Of course, this is at Staking Rewards. Hope to see you all there. And my name is Ken, and I am delighted to welcome today's guest, Jake Brookman. Jake founded CoinFund in 2015, one of the first blockchain-focused investment firms in the United States. He works closely with technology teams, building blockchain projects, networks, and crypto economic systems, and is known to have coined the term generalized mining and network lifecycle investing for CoinFund. He's a technologist with a background in mathematics and computer science and has experience in distributed systems, web development, product management, private equity research, quantitative trading, and startups. Previously, he was partner and CTO at Triton Research, technical product manager and engineer at Amazon.com, and spent five years in financial technology in New York City, including at Highbridge Capital Management. And he's also curator at firstedition.xyz, an NFT collection. And just important to note, CoinFund is doing a lot of work with NFTs in the NFT space. So welcome, Jake. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to have you here, Jake. And just a few questions here to break you in before we dive into the, the deeper questions. So uh, just wondering, have you read our 2021 staking ecosystem report yet? I have not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always check that out. Head on over to stakingrewards.com. Go to our journal section. It's actually a, a hundred plus page report. A lot of different uh, questions were sent out to the staking ecosystem leaders and we've compiled all this data. So it's really valuable. Uh, anyone watching, please check that out. And uh, Jake, for you, so which crypto projects spiked your interest first outside of BTC and Ethereum and why was that? Well, the way that um, I kind of came into the space is certainly because of Bitcoin. I actually got to know Bitcoin in, in, uh, in early 2011, uh, someone showed it to me. And that was really the way that I understood blockchain technology. It took me actually a little bit of time to understand it. It was only um, toward the end of 2013 that I started buying Bitcoin. But upon you know creating Coin Fund, the thesis really was the world beyond Bitcoin. Like what is uh, what is out there that we could apply this technology to, and have a really um, kind of disruptive process and build a new asset class. Um, I think Vitalik's white paper really laid it out for me. It's really what got me into the space full time is the idea of digital assets as an asset and blockchain technology as the underpinning technology for um, for that. Yeah, really cool and almost inspired, you know, by Vitalik's white paper there to participate with coin funds. So um, cool background. So uh, getting back into the term that you have coined this network lifecycle investing, uh, you coined this a while ago, what does that mean? And how has it changed over time? Absolutely. Um, well, you know, when you're when you're doing investments in the traditional world, maybe investing in companies, companies go through a certain life cycle, right? They start out as, you know, these very early, you know, pre-seed kind of investments where teams have ideas. They start to like build out products. They put those products into market. They achieve market fit. They go through a number of funding rounds. And eventually, you know, the goal for, uh, you know, for a private technology companies usually to go public at some point with a with a big product and a big um, kind of revenue stream. And when we started to research blockchain technologies and we started to see how people would build not companies, but decentralized networks or crypto networks, you know, you, you, you realize that crypto networks also have a bit of a life cycle, but it's different. So, you know, still a team comes together and they create an idea for a decentralized network. But usually what happens is they kind of public like much earlier than companies in the traditional world do. You know, a lot of these networks, they put forward digital assets that are trading on open public markets. And so this creates like totally different dynamics for how, you know, how a company uh, or a network might behave, how it might be capitalized, 
how do you determine the value um, you know, of such work? And so the life cycle that we're referring to when we say network life cycle, it's the life cycle of putting the network into production, bootstrapping it, because this is usually a public network that has a supply side of public spend. Like for example, if you're you know, launching a new blockchain, then you want to get a bunch of people to run nodes to validate your blockchain. If you are um, someone like the graph, graph is more like middleware doing data indexing coming from blockchains, right? Then you want a network of people who are uh, what's known as subgraphs, which are these nodes that index data. Or if you're on the live peer network, which is a network for video transcoding, you want people to run basically GPUs to do the transcoding work. So whatever that vocation is on the supply side, that's what you need to bootstrap in this kind of early stage of the network. Then you get the network out there. And then only in like 2020 really can, did we start to see networks actually generate revenue. This was during you know, the DeFi summer of 2020 when protocols like Uniswap and Balancer and, um, and Compound and Aave, right? would start to actually generate revenue from the financial services that they were offering. Um, and it's a little bit of a later stage in that network. And eventually, I think that these networks can get really, really big, really, really efficient, and put forward some really impressive competition toward you know, the traditional companies and structures that usually offer these services in the real world. And that's the network life cycle. Yeah, really cool that you're comparing a distributed network to a traditional company and, and kind of walked us through with the life cycle of a traditional of a, of a distributed network, what it looks like. And it's it's even more interesting to hear that it wasn't until really 2020 that we start seeing these protocols generate uh, sustainable revenue themselves. So it, it's really affirmation that we are still in the very early stages industry wide here. Um, so getting back into uh, VCs and how they impact these distributed networks. What do you think is the biggest value add blockchain networks get from their investors? And how different is that from a small investor to a large VC? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think um, I think that crypto investors play or are playing a really important role right now in terms of bridging the gap, right? So in so many different ways, investors um, connect the crypto native blockchain world to the traditional world. And that could mean like bringing in institutional capital. Really, this has been one of the biggest like end games of crypto is like, how do we get crypto adopted? Well, we need to get institutions to, you know, to invest in this space and, and really take, you know, be get excited and take a long position. That's happening now. We're watching the institutionalization of crypto kind of in real time at CoinFund these days. But the other really important way is, um, you know, like there's there tends to be two audiences of founders out there. There are these like really talented, really deep crypto native founders who are like phenomenal at building blockchains and doing this like deep technology and who are like relatively inexperienced or just new at um, building consumer experience, experiences, right? And, and user experiences and apps that people, the normal people can use. And then you have this whole other audience of traditional web two founders. They've worked at Facebook, they've at Amazon, um, they've built products for consumers, they've built products at scale, right? But they are very new to the crypto world and they are, you know, they, they don't know all the best practices. They don't know how to design a smart contract or, or a, a mechanism, a decentralized mechanism. And the role of, you know, I think coin fund a lot of the time is to bridge the gap between these folks and allow teams who are great at, you know, consumer and UX to follow the best practices of what they should be doing and how they should be launching products and blockchain and at the same time to help the very talented like deep tech blockchain people go to market right in um you know in a market of very traditional customers very non-technical customers not financial um customers so i would say like bridging the gap is a huge huge um kind of responsibility of investors and then there's a bunch of other stuff right there's like we create synergies 
within our portfolio would facilitate the integration of, I don't know, things like rareable protocol in, into companies that are trying to go to market with NFT products, right? And just helping them do that in efficient and, um, you know, and, and, and marketable ways. Um, and, and of course there, you know, there, there's a, there's a really important aspect of crypto investors specifically, which is that you want these investors as a founder, right. To, to help you not just build a company, but also build a network. And what does that mean? Well, it means like helping our companies on the network level. It's helping, um, doing things like adding capital and liquidity, uh, when there are liquidity provision opportunities or when there's a lending protocol, um, it means um, running validators or staking nodes, uh, which CoinFund does in a number of our portfolio networks to help the network, you know, succeed long term and be viable and, and operate. Um, and, and probably like a long tail of things that VCs normally do for companies, which is, you know, promote them essentially uh, and, and, and help them navigate their different um, areas and, and markets. Yeah, and it seems like for for Coin Fund and, and other VCs, there's a ton of value added to these networks uh, from the participating investors, and, and it's really good to see that it's not just money being thrown and that's it. You're actually bridging uh, gaps that exist from these founders yeah. and what they have for their skill set. So it's uh, it seems like and a pivotal piece of the puzzle there. Absolutely, and I just wanted to add, like I, you know, I didn't start out as a VC. I started out as a founder and as an engineer, right? And I, you know as I've done investing, I've come to appreciate um, more um, like the role of the investor in in this process. The investor has a much higher level view than the, than the companies who generally are like very hugged down building and they kind of see themselves and their competitors around them. But they don't always see, you know, these waves of innovation that that come to blindside them over time. And one of the other roles of the investors come to appreciate is just having that higher view and being able to, you know, help our companies uh, and, and networks navigate um, their space. Yeah, another great point there. Just uh, from an outside investor perspective or participant perspective, you can see from a high level where some of these bottlenecks might exist that the actual teams developing for instance, might not see. So uh, really cool that you're giving us those insights there. So in regards to those bottlenecks, what do you think is the biggest challenge and the biggest bottleneck for blockchain networks? Is this attracting talent to the core teams? Is it attracting users to participate in the network? Or is it something as simple as network security? Yeah, I would say one of the most common, there's a few common challenges that we, that we hear over and over from teams, but the number one right now is, how do we get talent and specifically technical talent? How do we get a CTO? How do we get an engineer? You know, the best teams out there, they're going to be kind of co-founded by, by technical founders. Um, if you're not a technical founder and you're in a position of like, oh, I need to find a technical co-founder, it is very hard. The, the space has grown tremendously. There's not a ton of people who have you know, long-term expertise in things like solidity development or smart contract development in general, who know how to use the tools, who've been through the, you know, um, kind of the potholes of, uh, of, of smart contract development. And so I, you know, that is a huge bottleneck. The other thing is um, when, when people do get together and start to put forward product, you know, in, in any technology or, 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 or space where, where you're promoting a product, like you need to do great marketing, you need to do great PR. This is especially true in crypto because crypto runs on open, global, online, digital communities. They run on DAOs. Um, they're constantly connecting in, in the metaverse in digital ways on Zoom, right? And so in this space, almost more than most of the other industries out there, like you need to be doing great marketing. You need to be doing great PR branding. You need to be out there. You need to be building communities. You need to be managing communities. That is a core part of what a crypto company and network does. Yeah. And I'm glad that you're saying it because there are some networks that don't appreciate how much marketing effort is needed to really achieve a successful decentralized network. And, and you know, obviously you, Jake, and at, at CoinFund, you guys realize that and you can now, you know, give some of that advice to the founders you work with. And 
really from your perspective as a VC firm with CoinFund, how do you decide uh, how strong to support certain investments? Well, I would say CoinFund is is not just a VC firm. We actually, we're a multi-strategy firm in the sense that we have um, venture and liquid strategies, but we certainly spend a lot of time on, on, on the venture side. Um, and sorry, your question was like on the venture side, how do we... Yeah, like basically how do you decide how strong you want to support okay. a certain investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's a it's a really interesting um, kind of thought as to like, what does it mean to be uh, an investor, right? And so, like, for example, you have a lot of people out there saying, hey, you know, DAOs are aggregating a lot of capital and are also investing in companies. They're going to like, you know, th they're going to put put investors out of business or something like that. And, th and the reality is that there's this very subtle distinction between what a DAO generally does today in networks and what, a, what an investor does. DAOs t tend to do capital allocation and investors tend to do portfolio construction. And those two things are like a little bit different. Portfolio construction is when you create a strategy that says, I'm gonna capture the value of a certain space. And that space has scope. It could be very general. It could be like only DeFi or only NFTs or something like that. And I'm gonna construct a portfolio um, that will be most probably giving me a great return, right? So in the in the traditional venture space, what that tends to look like is, you know, I'm gonna invest in um, about 25 companies and about 23 of them are gonna go out of business. And then like one of them is gonna get sold for like a little bit of money. And one of them is gonna turn into Uber and return, you know, multiples of my, of my whole fund, right? That's sort of what portfolio construction looks like in traditional deceit. But in crypto world, it's a very, very different problem. First of all, we have like way more, more verticals in crypto that are investable. Like we have base layers and DeFi um, and NFTs and DAOs and Web3. There's just like a huge diversity of extremely different companies doing very different things. You, um, moreover, they're not as binary. Like it's not like zero or one, this company succeeds or goes out of business. Sometimes you might have a network with a, with a public token that's trading on the market. And so you have liquidity and maybe they haven't achieved like full adoption, but, but they still have value. And, you know, people are kind of betting that they'll do something in the future. And so what this enables is a different kind of portfolio construction and crypto funds. It's like you tend to have more companies, not 25, but maybe like 50 in your portfolio. The diversification across areas is like much more diverse. Um, you know, when you think of like how many companies are going to go out of business, well, you know, a much smaller percentage than in a, in a traditional, um, traditional portfolio. So how do we decide like, like how, you know, when to go? Well, I mean, in the early stages, there's two key factors. Team, is it a great team? And there's timing. I remember um, I recently talked to a founder who's building a decentralized chat protocol. And he asked me, he said, you know, have you ever seen someone, um, you know, build what I'm building? And I said, yeah, I've seen about 17 of them, but you're the one who's actually going to succeed. And he says, why? And I say, well, because you have great timing, right? So how do we determine half of it is, you know, choosing uh, a vertical that we think is extremely important, extremely exciting is going to go next. Like NFTs went in February, right? Part of it is, does this fit into our portfolio construction? Is it the right vertical? Can we get enough size, um, you know, to fit it into the portfolio in, in, in the right way? Um, and a lot of it is like, have we reached the correct time for this technology to come to fruition? They'll really never underestimate how important timing is when, you know, deciding to make uh, certain investments. Very interesting. Um, so in regards to the portfolio construction, uh, which one of your portfolio projects has stood out most to date and why is it? Oh, we have so many, it's so hard to choose, but I'll, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you like at coin fund, we have a, a very interesting mix of extremely crypto native things like very experimental new things. Like we're, we're contemplating an investment right now uh, in a group of people who have from the very beginning 
organized as a DAO, not as a corporation of any kind, but just as a DAO. And then on the other side of it, there's some very important companies um, uh, that have a very traditional startup structure, like an equity structure, right? But are doing some phenomenally important work in the space. And one company that comes to mind in our portfolio is Block Damon. They just recently did uh, a funding led by SoftBank um, to the tune of like a billion dollar valuation based on the fact that they are rolling a lot of staking nodes, right? A lot of um, kind of infrastructure for people launching blockchains, but structured in a way that is like a very traditional, you know, kind of company. Um, and, you know, maybe on the, on the crypto native side, one of, you know, one of our best investments has been the graph, right? This is a company that um, insisted on putting a very decentralized network into the market that network is extremely useful for people who are engineering like front ends for, for decentralized applications. What it does is indexing of data that allows these front ends to be just like super duper efficient. Um, and what's absolutely fantastic is like the, the whole way that that network works is totally decentralized. So you run your own node, you kind of go into this crypto economic system where you're compensated for providing this indexing and you're also penalized for like not doing it correctly. Right. So there's this whole like game theory that you have to play. But as a result, this network can grow like way bigger than something that maybe like, you know, Amazon or, or Google can build um, because it's open and public and global and like anybody can participate in the world. Um, and so, you know, that's been an, an awesome uh, experience working with them. Yeah, and and very interesting. You say both Block Demon and the Graph. Uh, so Block Demon, we do have that uh, provider profile live on the website. So anyone watching that wants to go check them out, go to stakingrewards.com, search for Block Demon. You'll be able to see all the assets they provide uh, validator service for, for instance. And the Graph, we should have integrated on the site relatively soon in the coming weeks. Uh, really cool what they're doing with indexers, decentralized marketplace, and so on. So uh, cool that you see those as the few projects that stand out today. Um, now looking with some foresight here what is the one investment you see that from current standing is most likely to do 100x in the future well i, I don't think there's there's just one but let me paint you some um uh, let me paint you some thoughts so it's always about like which vertical do i think or do we think is going to be you know really successful and so like if, for example if we if we if we rewind back to like the summer of 2020, a lot of people were saying, look, DeFi protocols are conflicting. They're starting to generate, you know, billions of dollars of, of, of revenue. They're really going to be like the first ones to go mainstream. But what actually happened? NFTs went mainstream instead. And so, you know, why in retrospect, we can kind of look at it and say, well, it's because that collectibles or digital art use case probably appeals to a lot more consumers than these, you know, nerdy financial techie use cases like liquidity mining or yield farming, you know, doing derivatives on chain and things like that. Um, and so what we saw was that NFTs really had a kind of more of an asymmetry that was possible because the audience that they could get really was, was bigger and, and could get to closer to, to consumer adoption sort of where we are now with NFTs and early consumer adoption. So, but now it's October of 2021. And as we look forward, what do we, what do we think is going to be, you know, some of the most exciting developments? Well, if you look at the market, it's really just a few areas. Certainly NFTs continue to be in this like infrastructure phase, but I think a lot of companies that started looking at NFTs earlier this year in February when we went mainstream are probably going to be in market with NFT strategies like early to mid 2022. So NFT is a very interesting space to invest. And what should you invest in? Well, I would say probably like some infrastructure, right? Things like, like rareable coin, right? Marketplaces, um, issuance platforms, like things that are not taking maybe specific views on like which NFTs will be successful, but will process the bulk of NFTs. And then the other area that is, feels like it's bubbling and is about to get really hot 
and have kind of its first you know hype phase is web3 and what do i mean by web3 i mean it's the set of tools and protocols that allow people to build truly decentralized applications so this is like the storage protocols like ipfs and rweave it's the middleware uh protocols like ceramic network or the graph or um uh you know things that um manage like domain names and and stuff like that and on the top there's actual applications like one application that's easy to point to in the market right now is mirror.xyz this is kind of a fully decentralized app which is a decentralized medium it's a publishing platform which has these like token financialization features and you could do things like crowdfund your essay or you know launch a token supply around a piece of writing or you know things like that right so i think when people start to when consumers will start to you know see these decentralized apps and be able to interact with them that's when the light bulb moment is going to go off and we go oh that's what you meant by by that it's when we decentralized twitter and we, we decentralized facebook and you know things like that um and if we can find ways of, you know, getting exposure to this Web3 stack, then I, I do think that's something that could potentially go uh, and be and have a really big inflection point, like you're saying. Well, definitely. Thank you for sharing that with us here, Jake. I think anyone in the audience watching probably got some really good trading ideas uh, based on what you just gave us there. So really focus on Web3 down the line here and uh, we might see the next 100x opportunity appear. Um, so what period of time do you think is most uh, crucial for success? Now talking about proof of stake networks. So what period of time do you think is most crucial for the success of proof of stake based blockchains? Would this be like the initial distribution of tokens, the initial mm. traction it gets or the long term reliability and uh, security of the network? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. The sh I think the short answer is like it's it's probably the ability of the network to uh, accumulate a community and that generally happens in the earlier stage. Let me, t let me talk a little bit about why I think that. I mean, I think for a long time, people in crypto in broadly, right, have been, have been trying to figure out like, what are, how do we value digital assets? And there's like all these different models that have, that have been brought forward. Some people say, oh, you know, in Bitcoin, it's like stock to flow, or it's the, you know, the value of the electricity that you need to burn to, you know, to solve the, 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 the hash puzzle. Um, other people have said, look, it's the, it's the uh, quantity theory of money, MV equals PQ, you know, we should calculate that. The reality is that most of these models have really not predicted any kind of real prices out there in the market. So something's going on. And I think like recently, the way that I've break, broken it down in my mind is that there's really like two categories of valuation models in crypto. One is this very traditional one based on cash flows. Like, hey, is my protocol, you know, getting a bunch of revenue? And can I like discount that and, and find a valuation for the token right now? And the other one, which confounds um, traditional investors to a large degree, is this idea of like accumulating social capital. It's like we look at crypto punks and they say, like, how can this thing be valuable? It's just a JPEG. But the reality is that it's a JPEG that coordinates a lot of attention on a specific concept, in this case, the concept of a collectible. But it's those kinds of, you know, social capital models that I think are bread and butter to crypto. And the way that those capital models actually accumulate value is by building, um, you know, strong aligned communities. Some of the best examples in the market of that are these like 10K NFT series that are out there. Um, and those are, you know, the, the best ones are gonna be the ones that have the widest distribution and have the largest audience and, um, you know, kind of the most aligned audience in the sense that they like love these NFTs, they wanna create billboards of them, they wanna like get tattoos of them, you know, don't get tattoos of them, but, you know, people spray paint them on the wall and in, in, in brooklyn right all of these things and so those those are the projects that seem to do very well in a proof of stake network it's very much similar right it's like you want to get an aligned community of people who are perhaps 
on the supply side of that network or running staking nodes, if it's a blockchain, you know, whatever the case may be. But if you can get a wide distribution and a large audience, that tends to make networks, I would say, more successful than networks that don't do that. Yeah, I mean, that's some really valuable insights there. So really, it's it's focusing on this distribution initially uh, to capture capture social networking or social network effect, right? So um, I guess I'll have to remove my tattoo of uh, Board Apes Yacht Club, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's really valuable insight there. And so focusing back on CoinFund again here, uh, what is the main source of deal flow at CoinFund? Do you get referred to most from friends, for instance, or do you source them yourself? Or do founders just come out and contact you directly with their own pitches? Absolutely. Um, we get a ton of inbound at CoinFund. And one of the reasons is because we're known as, you know, a great early uh, or partner to early stage teams building in the blockchain space. We're a hands-on investor. We have an organization of 22 people today that helps companies and networks kind of build out what they want to do. Um, and we have a network of kind of existing portfolio companies that, you know, tend to refer uh, entrepreneurs to us. We have a network of colleagues in the space that tends to refer. So we get a lot of inbound, but I think like one of the, one of the other important things that we do is, um, is really to form theses about what will be big, right? Like it's one of the things that we've historically done really well. We were very early um, to the NFT space during Dapper Labs in 2018, additional in 2019, Preceders of Rarible, one of the biggest NFT marketplaces in 2020. Um, you know, co uh, co leads of Upshot, which is an NFT pricing protocol. Um, later than that, and then you know, like one of the important things that we have to do is try to predict, make an educated guess about like what area of blockchain you know will will be big next. And like I love this example. Someone said it on the podcast. I wish I could give them credit. I don't know who it was, but they said you know like in 1880 it was pretty. Uh, predictable that we would invent cars with a lot of people working on that but it was pretty unpredictable that we would by extension invent traffic jams and so what's usually pretty hard is you know we look at the tech and we can kind of draw broad strokes about like yeah you know i think a lot of blockchains will be proof of stake from here on out or there's going to be a lot of like two or scalability technologies that will enable better ux but it's hard to exactly predict the implications of those things. And it's hard to predict like what people will build on top of, you know, those kinds of, uh, of innovations. Right. Um, so I'm not sure if I totally answered the question, but, um, yeah, no, you, you did. I exactly. give some color. <laughs> so if you're, if you're a founder out there, uh, don't be shy to submit any kind of inbound pitches, uh, to Jake over here at CoinFund. He'll, <laughs> he'll be ears wide open for totally. you. And, and my DMs are open on Twitter. So, um, you know, I don't answer everything, but feel free to hit me up there um, and send me your, your deck. And so, Jake, where do you see CoinFund evolving in the next 10 years? How many portfolio companies or would you still be supporting some of the same projects? How many employees do you think you'll have? And will your vision change? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we've been growing uh, aggressively. Um, as I said, we're now up to 22 people and we're, we're continuing to hire. We have over um, 100 portfolio companies. This year we've hired Vanessa Grillet, who used to be executive director of Consensus to lead, uh, lead us as head of, head of point funds portfolio growth. So she you know, interfaces with our companies and um, adds a lot of support uh, to them. Um, I think over time, we continue to look to be a multi-strategy firm with many different strategies. Um, certainly venture is a huge uh, aspect of that. We, we launched our venture fund in uh, March. That was an $83 million uh, fund. Um, and we, you know, we think we'll continue to, uh, to put venture strategies on our platform and also to continue kind of going down uh, into like middle middle growth stages, right? As companies become more and more mature and like following on to uh, our portfolio companies and new companies that are now like in those stages. At the same time, we launched our liquid strategy led by our head of 
uh, liquid investments, Seth Gins in uh, February of 2020. So that continues to grow and, and really look at some of the you know later stage, like more mature um, uh, assets that are that are in the in the liquid markets. Um, we uh, we we just launched our NFT strategy, which is called Metaversal. We're excited for that to launch the first week of uh, NFT NYC. Um, and you know, I, I see us putting you know more and more products on the platform over time. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've seen the growth myself, but I'm really surprised how much you're talking about the NFT vertical here and how many resources that you seem to have put into it. Um, and we have a question from the audience here. What is the next big market vertical after NFTs? And uh, in case you missed that earlier there, Jamie, it was Web3, I believe, is what you mentioned there, Jake. Yeah, I would say I would say like the the, the four like really interesting things in, in crypto native world is NFTs, uh, Web3, DAOs, uh, and DeFi, right? So right now NFTs are, they've had this big hype cycle. They're in an infrastructure stage. You know, I think they'll come back in a big way next year. I think Web3 is just coming to that first big hype cycle because we all know that crypto kind of like works in these hype cycles where, you know, we get a lot of attention, we raise a bunch of capital, then everything sort of consolidates and people go and build and then it comes back in an even bigger way later. Um, DAOs are starting to happen. There's something like $10 billion under management estimated in DAOs right now. And they're starting to have like really interesting use cases, not just investments, but, um, you know, people starting to consider them in an ESG context, like the G and ESG. Um, we're going to, we're going to publish a paper on that, on that shortly, but it's almost like great technology for, revisiting the inclusivity and democratization of corporate governance and maybe hey maybe corporations have few things to learn from from DAOs and the way that they've been operating in the market so very inclusively so that's a super interesting space and it has a it has a good growth potential and and look defi is there there's a lot of innovation in defi but none of that innovation has been brought to real regular consumers in the market so there's still a huge opportunity in DeFi to do that. Yeah, and I wonder if there's going to be some kind of crossover between all of these verticals. We see one project that sort of dips its toes in all aspects, and that might be the big winner if you could find it. Um, so you've obviously, you know, you've spoken to hundreds, I'm sure, founders, right? And these are all probably really inspiring people. Um, but who is the most inspiring founder you've ever met? And how important do you think founders and thought leaders are for decentralized networks? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, that is so, it's so hard to choose because there's such a diversity of folks out there, right? There's, there's people who are younger and less experienced, but who are like super motivated to come and build and like change the world. There's experienced entrepreneurs, um, who bring their experience to bear on these like new products and putting them into market. I, I really don't think I could select one. Um, but, if I wanted to highlight a few folks, so, you know, so Yaniv, uh, Tal from the graph, the CEO of Half, I thought, you know, he did an excellent job and sort of his guns as CEO and saying, excuse me, saying, you know, hey, this net network should be completely decentralized. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of people were like looking at the graph in early stages and sort of saying, a lot of smart people too sort of saying like, hey, you know, this this could be like a centralized product. Like you don't really need this to be decentralized. But I feel like Yaniv stuck to his guns and he was like, no, nope, there's some real core decentralization value propositions here um, that are absolutely excellent and, and, and we need to stick to them. Um, I think, you know, Taking and, and Yaniv is a pretty experienced founder, right? He's had like multiple companies in his career. And um, there's another group, you know, speaking of DAOs, it's called Orca Protocol. And these are young folks who are like extremely plugged into the DAO space. And they're sort of, um, you know, Julia Rosenberg is the CEO. And, and you know, they're thinking about like, how do we, um, how do we like create like technology DAOs that are that's really usable and composable. And so they're really like thinking in a very forward looking manner because what we're actually starting to see now is a lot of projects coming for investment 
being structured as a DAO out of the gate, but having like relatively little, you know, few tools to, to manage that. And what, what Julia and her team are building are the, this idea of a pod, which is like these small groups of people who are kind of purpose driven, but you can compose these little DAOs together into like larger organizations. And I think it's a very futuristic idea. I don't think the market is there yet, but in, in a short while, we'll see how, um, you know, how important having good organizational tools really, really is. Um, and this is an example of like a young team who, who's like, you know, very, very forward thinking um, on this topic. Yeah, so it seems like a, a pretty diverse set of founders there that are impressive to you. And, uh, you know, it's, hearing the story of the founder of the graph there sticking to his guns on decentralization, um, you know, it just makes me even more excited for what they're producing uh, with the decentralized marketplace there. Um, so really cool stuff there. Thanks for the insights. And so you doing a lot of research on token designs and value drivers for different networks. Have you ever thought of launching your own token network or your own DAO? Like me personally, Jake, or as coin, or coin or, funds. I guess it would be out of coin funds. Yep. Well, personally, I actually, you know, I've had occasion to experiment with social tokens. Um, I don't want to say that uh, that that I'm like super active in that field, but it, there's definitely a couple of service providers that came along, and I I tried I tried some of them out. I have a, a Jake token just kind of as a proof of concept, and usually, you know, if someone owns Jake token. Um, give them like a little bit of a discount on my on my NFT art that I that I create. Um, on, as Coin Fund, I would say like we're always looking for ways that we as a fund can use blockchain technology or a token or a network or saying um, ourselves. And the way that that most saliently uh, seems to be kind of plausibly playing out is that. You know, we have a company in our portfolio called Syndicate DAO. And Syndicate is working on, you know, sort of on-chain tooling for some relatively like traditional structures. Like when someone wants to do a special per vehicle, an SPV, or maybe even like launch a fund, um, they can now do that on Syndicate um, and, and manage like the cap table using blockchain, manage the capital flows using blockchain. And it's compatible with, sort of legal structures as well. So when we think about using blockchain tech, thinking about like running an SPV on syndicate or, or maybe even eventually having a fund that's uh, managed on chain in that way. And the other thing that comes to mind is fundraising, right? Like uh, maybe through security tokens or something in the future, but there have been a few funds that have done that and, and have, um, you know, kind of created digital asset securities that, that are at risk in their fund. Um, I think there's some chance that um, this will be a fundraising mechanism for folks uh, in the future. Mm, maybe foreshadowing to what's to come. So really cool. Uh, thank you for all the insights today, Jake. This has been uh, really interesting just talking with you and, and getting some of your insights on what Coin Fund is up to and how you look to fund certain projects and what level of activity is required on your end. Uh, where can people go to find more information on the stuff you're working on? Absolutely. Um, so first of all, Follow CoinFund on Twitter. It's CoinFund underscore .io. Follow me on Twitter. It's J-B-R-U-K-H. Um, read our blog. It's blog.coinfund.io. Um, and if you're in Lisbon this week and next week, uh, come chat with our team. If you are in New York, uh, first week of November for NFT NYC, you know, come chat with our team. Um, and uh, and otherwise, I'll see you. I'll see you online. Awesome. We'll be sure to follow you on all those social handles. And uh, for everyone watching, I want you to check out previous episodes of Staking Mondays and make sure to read our 2021 ecosystem staking, uh, staking ecosystem report that was just released late last week. If you go to stakingrewards.com, uh, there's a link right in the blue bar that's also to our 2021 Staking Summit that will be taking place this Wednesday, October 20th. So just go to the website, click on the blue bar and register for that. We're going to have great speakers from uh, companies like Chainflow, Everstake, Staffy. Of course, Staffy Protocol is going to be a big one and Persistence and so on. It's going to be a really great event. So thank you again for everyone to wa for watching this episode. Please like and subscribe to our channel. As always, happy staking. Thanks again for joining us here today, Jake. Take care. All right. Thanks for having me, Ken. Cheers.